everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Allison Yeller. I am the co-chair of Who's an Entrepreneurship. Um, thanks everyone for taking the time on what I know is a very beautiful day, at least here in New York City and hopefully wherever all of you are. Um, thanks also to the Virginia Club of New York and the UVA Office of Engagement for supporting and hosting this event. Um, couldn't do it without them. Thank you, Michael, also for your support. Um, this event is being recorded, just so everyone knows. Um, so the recording will be available to everyone, all of you later, and for anyone who couldn't make the event. Um, we're also going to be sharing a presentation that we're going to be using as a basis of our panel. So we'll be sharing that with everyone later as well. So don't have to scramble, hopefully, to take too many notes. Um, so just to give like a little bit of brief background on who's an entrepreneurship. So we're a community of interest within the Virginia Club of New York. Started around last summer, we've been doing events pretty much monthly since then, um, aimed at giving both practical advice and moral support to alumni and students who are pursuing entrepreneurial ventures or are thinking about doing so. Um, and we wanted to do this event because we know that fundraising is always, or often anyway, a topic of interest to entrepreneurs and to founders. Um, but we, we have found that a lot of founders don't really know where to start or what the basics are and just kind of need that overall primer on, you know, what's the vocabulary? What um, do I need to know before I start to fundraise so that I don't make mistakes, whether they're kind of legal mistakes or they're um, just, mistakes about the overall path and philosophy that you adopt with regards to fundraising, because there are so many different ways to go about it. And they're all going to be dependent on you as a founder and what your mission, your overall goals are. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So that's why we wanted to do this event. Um, so we'll be doing um, a panel discussion that's going to be moderated by my co-chair, Anthony. Um, and then, um, and you can feel free, everyone's going to be on mute, but if you have any specific questions, feel free to drop them into the chat um, and we'll do our best to ask them. Um, we're also, we're going to do the panel for about 45 minutes and then we'll have about 20 minutes of breakout rooms. So you will be able to choose which panelists we'll introduce in a moment. Um, you have your breakout room with. So if you have specific questions for one of the panelists, you'll have an opportunity to ask them. Um, so with that in mind, oh yeah, and we're going to aim to hopefully end around 7.15. Um, so, you know, with respect for everyone's time, um, that's that's gonna be our goal. Um, I think that's it in terms of what my sort of kickoff notes are. So I'm gonna go ahead and share our presentation and we will get started with our intros and with our panel. All right, so kicking off fundraising 101 or what you need to know before you raise. So just to briefly introduce our panelists who are very thankful uh, for them for sharing their time and expertise. Always great to bring together those in our in our WHO community to, uh, to share their advice. So um, moderating, we have Anthony Simasek, who as I mentioned is the co-chair of Who's an Entrepreneurship um, and also the co-founder of the um, technology company Hospitality Innovations. Our first panelist is Melody Ko. Um, Melody spent her career working in technology and internet startups. She's been kind of on both sides um, in terms of working at startups and working in venture capital, so has a really valuable perspective to share. She was former head of product at Blue Apron when they were in a big growth phase and is now a partner at NextU Ventures. So I'm um, very happy to have her perspective today. Coming to us from the legal side of the house, we have Tom Cotavilla. Tom is a lawyer. He focuses on data privacy, startup law, intellectual property, lots of topics of interest to startup founders. And he's also been in-house counsel for a venture-backed startup. So again, has a lot of really rich experience to share. Um, Tom also was the bouncer at Coops when he was um, at UVA. So, you know, just throwing that out there. Um, then rounding out our panel, we have Alex Russell. So Alex is representing kind of our founder who's currently kind of in the trenches doing this. Alex is the founder of Nothing Special, a pre-launch alcohol alternative brand and media company. Um, so very happy to have these kind of diverse perspectives to, to talk about fundraising and these kinds of ins and outs um, of what you need to know before you raise. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Anthony to start our panel. Great, great. Thanks, Allison. Um, and thank you to our panelists uh, for joining us tonight. Um, so, you know, this topic has been uh, very near and dear to me um, as a, a recent founder. Um, about six months ago, I started my company and I kind of feel like I'm 
uh, at the pool like early in the summer and I keep dipping my toe in the water and trying to decide if I should jump in. And, and I think that what Allison and I have heard from uh, a number of, of people that have joined the, the Who's an Entrepreneurship events is that there's a lot of fear around the idea of fundraising, a lot of unknowns. And um, so what our goal is tonight is to kind of break down some of those barriers and some of those walls and to provide, um, you know, a little bit of context and, and some ideas from people who have uh, done it. Uh, we're lucky to have a founder who's done it, um, legal representation who's been through it, and, and Melody who, who's seen it from both sides. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us started and, and turn it over to our panelists. Um, I'll, for the panelists, I'll be asking kind of questions directed at, at one or two of you, but feel free if any of you do have, you know, comments on, on any of the topics, you know, please jump in um, and, and we'll make it a, an informative 45 minutes here. Um, so the first place we thought we'd start is kind of with your entity choice. And Tom, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of people think that in order to raise money, you, you have to incorporate as a, a C Corp in Delaware. Um, and, and if you don't do that, then then the fundraising path or, or VC path is kind of off the table. Um, so what are kind of the different entity options that you have and, and the fundraising options that exist within uh, the entity type that maybe you, you have currently? Yeah, I'd echo that in that you don't necessarily have to be a Delaware C Corp in order to raise capital. There are many different ways of raising capital. We'll discuss those later. But uh, if you don't immediately want to seek venture money, it's probably okay in some situations to have an LLC. You can have safe notes in an LLC. LLCs can issue convertible debt. Uh, but the more sophisticated you get and the higher up in the funding ecosystem you go, the more people will start to prefer C corporations. Uh, S corporations are something, they're a unique tax structure that uh, I would only recommend to people who are probably going to be generating enough cash in the first year to make that venture their full-time employment. Um, and therefore they'll be able to save on employment taxes. Don't want to get too deep into that yet. Uh, and then there's also sole proprietorships. Now, as a sole proprietor, you're probably not going to be going out and trying to get venture funding. If you do, uh, they'll probably tell you to convert to a C Corp. But there is nothing wrong with starting up your own business as a sole proprietorship, as an LLC, just to get going if you don't have immediate fundraising needs or sophisticated capital needs. Great. And uh, Alex, so when, when you started your company, I'm sure that you know, you kind of went through these different uh, legal structures and, and um, you know, to kind of give a little background, maybe you could, you could talk a little bit, you know, your, your pre-seed uh, with, with your company, you've already gone through a fundraising round, I, I know, um, and maybe talk about how that was done within the, um, the entity that you chose. Yeah, so um, I knew pretty early on, I was going to need to raise capital to launch uh, our beverage brand the right way. Um, and I can speak to that later in the conversation too. But um, yeah, C Corp to me, and can hear your thoughts on this, Tom, but uh, it, it was clearly the best option to raise capital, tried and true, uh, pretty standard ways to do it. And it's easy for entrepreneurs these days. We used a company called Clarky, uh, made it very easy. You know, on the one hand, you don't want to spend a bunch of legal fees creating your C Corp, but you also don't want to just use some quick template you find online. Clarky's a nice in-between. Um, so we were to make able to make our C Corp and then move forward with our safe fundraising um, into that entity. Yeah, I have no problem with using services like Clarky. As you get more sophisticated, you'll, um, you know, let's say you get an investor in, those form documents will probably go out the window. Uh, in terms of an LLC versus C Corp, the reason sometimes I recommend folks use LLCs is that they don't, uh, they're a lot easier to handle from a corporate record keeping standpoint. And they're a lot more flexible as an entity. They have less formalities than the C Corp. Uh, but that said, if you know you're gonna have to raise, definitely go C Corp, uh, especially at the, the start. Um, there are uh, certain advantages to not having to convert, say six months or a year into your life cycle. And so, uh, Melody, on the on the venture side, I know when we were having our, our pre-call, 
um, we were kind of talking about how you you've done some some uh, venture capital work with LLCs, and you know, in order for them to to raise money from you in in the end state, you you force them to convert. Um, is that kind of a pretty common process that once you get to the VC round, you're, you're going to be forced to make this change into the, the C corp? Yeah, I mean, to keep things easy for people, I think like Tom said, most venture capital firms have their, I mean, it's not like we don't like LLC, it's not our choice. We have legal structure, which prohibits us from owning X percent, which the X is pretty small, um, and anything that's not a C corp. Uh, and so we just, it's just like more, much more hassle to deal with than most uh, VC firms uh, would choose not to do that and to ask the companies to basically convert to a C Corp. Uh, this is an equity round. So meaning you're owning, you, you know, you're basically buying shares uh, and become an equity holder of the company. Now, uh, the, the, I think I forgot whether Alex said that or, or Tom, but you know, if you're just raising on the safe, which is basically safe is basically like a promise note to future issuance of equity. So then we don't necessarily become the equity holder at that moment, then it's okay. But a recent thing that we did, uh, with one of our accelerator companies is they're an LLC. And we basically just add a side letter to say, Hey, if you, if you're raising an equity round later, you will have to, you promise that you have to convert into a C Corp uh, because we can't, we can't hold uh, your, you know, preferred stock in this entity in the form of LLC. So. Makes sense. And Melody with that, you know, is, can you maybe walk us through here a little bit, uh, some of the different option, the different rounds of, of fundraising and, you know, how, how people can go about doing that. Um, you know, between the angel and friends and family uh, to seed and, you know, the series rounds that you've talked about where, where venture capital kind of comes in. Yeah. So um, again, you know, we'll start super high level and then you can go into more. So usually I, I would classify kind of like what people see on the, on the screen. Um, there's a lot of talks of different terminologies at the C stage. Uh, we are a C stage investor and Five years ago, there was not a thing called pre-seed. Now there is a thing called pre-seed. Um, think of seed as a category, uh, a very broad spectrum. And the real difference is that who you're raising the money from. Um, you know, if you're raising a, a 500K, a million dollar, all the way to three or $4 million round, you can kind of just, it's all within the seed spectrum. Um, now the difference is going to be who are the investors? And I would say that the two major types would be institutions versus non-institutions. By institutions, I mean professional investors, you know, kind of like a fund like us, we manage other people's money where, you know, these people are called limited partners, whether they're UVA endowment or pension funds or whatnot. Um, so these are institutional investors and they have a different set of expectations uh, in terms of returns profile. And then they're individuals and broadly defined, they're, they're called angels. And within angels, you can have more sophisticated, which I call them professional angels or more sophisticated angels who can be your you know, multi-time founders who have done this before and or senior execs from large tech companies who've exited. And they're more sophisticated because they are in the space uh, that most likely that you're raising money from and they do more, uh, they see more volume, the less sophisticated could be your former boss. Uh, that doesn't mean it's like good or bad. It just means that taking money from, you know, your former boss who's a MD at McKinsey uh, or a partner at McKinsey is different. It, that, that person brings a different set of network and advice than raising from, you know, the former head of product at Airbnb, uh, depending on what the, where you're building versus raising money from an institutional investor like us or other venture firms. Um, series A is, you know, and then you go into the alphabet, Series A these days are usually like a 10, $15 million rounds um, with pretty, uh, with milestones are honestly like 
pretty pushed out compared to five years ago. So these companies can be doing, you know, can be probably growing 3x year, year over year, can be doing, you know, two, three, four million dollar ARRs annual recurring revenue if you're a SaaS business. Uh, you can be a $10 million run rate business uh, as an e-commerce business, for example. Um, so, so that's a super high level, kind of how I would describe uh, these stages of financing. And the last thing I would say is 10 years ago when seed was not necessarily a category or just becoming a category, it is common for people to raise one round of seed financing and then go to series A. These days it's actually not uncommon for people to raise more than one round of seed stage financing before they go to series A because the series A expectations are much higher. Thus, the nomenclature people are breaking now like, oh, we raised a pre-seed, so now we're raising seed. Or I, I get these, I call these like round round name note uh, innovation. Today I got I got an introduction, someone raising a pre-series A round. It's like, I don't know what that is. Or post-seed, post-pre-seed round. And people are making these names up and they're like, okay, well, they're, they're just like, you know, so, so my partner, Dave, wrote a blog post about the atomization of seed and there are multiple paths to get a series A. Uh, and it's no longer just one, uh, you know, of course, less dilution is better for you if you can get it done in one shot, but uh, there are just a lot of different paths to get to the, uh, the later stage of milestones. Yeah, no, thanks. And uh, so Alex, you know, I, I think that you're kind of in um, pre-seed, uh, you know, if, if you will, or um, friends and family angel around. Um, how did you decide ultimately that you were going to go into a pre-seed round or a fundraising round versus uh, bootstrapping? Because for me, that's kind of been the, the big uh, conundrum. Um, and, and ultimately, I've decided to, to bootstrap first and, and then fundraise. And six months ago, I would have told you I was going to fundraise first. Um, and, and you kind of go back and forth. So what is it that kind of pushed you to go fundraising before you know before you even had a had a product. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the themes I want to touch on is you know as a founder you have to think for yourself. Every startup is completely unique, and although you can read books like one of my favorite was Zero to One by Peter Thiel that give you ideas and inspiration and frameworks about how to create a company, end of the day you are doing something completely unique and copying others or learning from frameworks is often de detrimental. Um, and I think Melody was kind of talking to that too. Like there are paths to financing, but for every kind of company, if there is investor demand, they're going to find a way to get it funded, even if it goes around the typical pre-seed, seed, series A path. So um, in that sense, thinking about my company, you know, I knew right away that, um, not right away, but after delving into food and beverage, I, I worked in uh, consumer retail m a previously. And you see a lot of these like high growth food and beverage brands do well with a good amount of capital. You know, it's easy to launch a beverage brand, uh, but it's not easy to launch one that really has legs. And by legs, I mean, you know, generating revenue five years after millions of dollars of revenue. Um, there's sort of like the farmer's market approach, slow growth to creating a beverage brand. But then there's the, the faster approach where you need, you really need capital. Uh, a lot of it, uh, to create a great product and a great brand um, and then win brand share at launch and then just a lot of working capital too to create the, uh, the in initial inventory. Um, so I knew, you know, um, we're doing something somewhat disruptive as an alcohol alternative and there are analogs with meat and dairy alternatives um, where they raise capital, um, were able to, to, you know, take advantage of health and wellness tailwinds and really lead the pack as category creators. So I'm trying to create something similar and you really do need the gunpowder to do that. Um, but again, every company is different. So you have to think about what you want and sometimes bootstrapping is the best. Another uh, influence was also, I'm a solo founder. So I'm more willing to give away equity than maybe a mm -hmm. team with more founders who might want to bootstrap longer. I was more willing to take capital early on. Yeah, that's a, it's a good point because, it, you know, for me, it's, it's me and two others um, and that equity dilution, you know, makes it a lot harder to, to swallow the idea of, of, you know, raising, raising money until you absolutely have to. 
Um, but, you know, on the, in the same note, though, kind of here with fundraising versus bootstrapping, um, you know, we talked about it too, uh, Tom and, and Melody, and, and either one of you can jump in here. You know, do you have to end up with venture capital just because you start with, you know, the, the angel round, pre-seed round, or even the seed round? Do you have to end, you know, in, in a venture round? Is, is that kind of, once you get started, are you, are you stuck on this path? Are you able to kind of go only on it as long as you need to be, you know, on the path, if you will? Um, I'm happy to, to kick off here. Uh, no, I, I would say the, the, the big fork in the road that people need to consider is the distinction around taking institutional capital. Um, again, it's pretty important, like, you raising money from Anthony's personal balance sheet is very different than you raising money from a fund that Anthony manages who has return expectations because that's the business that he's in. So those two things are very different. I'm not saying that angel investors don't want to make money. Everybody wants to make money. That's why they invest, right? Uh, but I'll just give you a quick, very quick example. Uh, if you raise money from an angel investor and if the angel investor 10x the, his or her money five years from now, that's pretty, they're pretty happy. Um, if you raise money from us and we end up owning 10% of the company and, you know, but then like five years from now, you end up selling the company, even though it was at a $5 million post money valuation. And then five years from now, we sell it for $50 million. Um, you know, let's say we still own 10%. I mean, that's, still, that's 10x return too, but that doesn't, you know, if, we're, if I'm managing a $100 million fund, you know, 10% of the $50 million outcome is 5 million bucks. So that doesn't even return a 10th of my fund. And I sign up to manage our limited partner's money to 3x our fund. So that's why there's difference in return expectation and portfolio management. So I would say general rule of thumb is that if you're raising money from institutional investors, why do people always talk about market size and like billion dollar outcomes is because you can do the math again. If we own 10% at exit and your company is a billion dollar exit, which by the way is very impressive and takes a long time to build to that scale. And that, and that doesn't even count. Oh, then our ownership gets diluted. That 10% times a billion is a hundred million. So that, that means I just return our investors money back one X. And most startups fail. So it's a power law game of our basket of 30 portfolio companies. 10 years later, I need to make sure there are at least three or more of these types of outcomes that can return one X or multiple X's of our fund. And that's, we're doing our jobs appropriately. And so, so that's kind of how I would think about it. And like, we're a hundred million dollar fund. There are many funds that are 10 times larger. So you have to, then that's why they're like, I don't even care about a billion dollar outcome. I care about, Ten billion dollar outcomes because otherwise they can't do the fund math doesn't work. Um, so it's a math problem. So that's why you have to understand the people's business model to think about return expectations. So coming back to like the, the 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 fork in the road, once you start taking institutional money, you have expectations like that. And if you don't take institutional money, you can be like eighty percent owner of a company that sold for hundred million dollars. You you probably have a better life than I do, right? So like that's not necessarily a bad thing. So I would just be really thoughtful about what do you think is a true market opportunity and what kind of companies you want to build and what essentially like tell people like, what do you want to sign up for? Because once you sign up for the institutional venture route, you kind of are like somewhat on the hook. I mean, obviously I can't tell you what to do because we're not majority owners, but that's kind of the, 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 the bargain that you're striking when you're taking institutional capital, which includes all sorts of classes of venture investors. Uh, angel investors are going to be slightly more flexible. And a lot of times, you know, angels support you because they like you or, you know, they trust you, they believe in you or they're interested in this space. So angel investing can have a lot of different motivations beyond pure returns. Obviously, again, no one wants to lose their money. Um, but I would say like, last thing I would say is that I constantly tell people that like, don't just think about like venture is the only route because at the end, the other thing is, a lot, if not a hundred percent, but a lot of investors in the venture world are software and technology investors. 
And that's kind of how the industry is constructed. So if you're not building companies that have technology leverage or fit kind of the mold of what people are looking for in terms of investing, you might have a harder time because that's not what they are, what's not, that's not their mandate. Um, so, and because the growth and the profitability and, and the margin profiles are different than what, they, what they're looking for. So those are all the things to consider. Yeah, and I mean, I'll just jump in real quick. Like, I completely agree that VC money is not the only capital out there. I mean, to be frank, capital is kind of a commodity and yeah, VC firms can absolutely steer you in a direction that you don't necessarily want to go because they have LPs that are dictating their decisions in many ways. And I'm a big fan of Chamath. I'm going to butcher his last name, Paula Pattaya. Um, he's had some issues with the SPAC craze lately, but the VC game is a little bit... Um, his words, not mine, a bit of a charade. Um, and you need to, you know, this is your baby as a company and you want to let people in who have your best interest in mind, the vision of the company in mind. There's actually another who founder, Robert Peck of um, Commonwealth Joe Coffee. And he's raised like tens of millions of dollars from angels alone. Um, because like Melody was saying, angels are more flexible, family offices are more flexible. My goal is to just raise from strategic angel, angels still, um, select family offices and maybe the right kind of VC, but also as Melody said, you know, they have certain return expectations and they're trying to make every company a tech company. And some companies are not meant to be tech companies and not everything should be tech. Um, so yes, absolutely. There's so many, there's so many sources of capital out there don't be, be beholden to the VC route just because it's a sexy thing to do. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of the, the myth that, that I was trying to debunk here a little bit um, was this idea that there's so much money out there and, and there's all these people investing in uh, founder teams and an idea. Um, and you know when you kind of come into the entrepreneur world, it's like you see Shark Tank, you see the the Gallant Challenge uh, down at UVA. There's all these different, you know, investor opportunities where you think money's just getting kind of thrown around at at people. And you know, um, Melody, I, you know, I'm kind of curious what you think um, being in the VC world. I mean, do you feel like there's a lot more money out there right now than uh, than there used to be, or or what, what is it that you guys are kind of seeing? Um. So, I mean, I, I mentioned Hatley's tweet. Uh, he's, he's, he's at another fund uh, that we collaborate with a lot. And, you know, I would, I would answer that question in two ways. One is in more of a technology sector and one is outside of traditional, um, traditional uh, professional investors. Even within our world, you have public market guys coming in to do private deals, lay stage. You know, there are a lot of SPAC money that takes companies public Sometimes you can argue prematurely. Sometimes you can argue that's an unlock of traditional IPO, you know, bottlenecks. Uh, there is more, there, there, there is a lot of activity, but I, you know, I think I summarize as the haves and have nots. Um, the haves are getting more attention and they are raising at a higher valuation. The have nots are still not, like it is on average raising money. You know, I, I was a founder at one point in my career and it's not easy. Um, it's, you know, it's, I, I tell founders in our portfolio is like, you're kissing a hundred frogs and then you like find a true believer. And that's a typical fundraising process, whether you eventually become successful or not. Now, outside of the traditional, uh, funding environment and funding sources, I think it's true that there are, I, I think there, there, maybe there's a little bit of like, oh, maybe VC is like the standard way of doing things from people's perception. But I actually think a lot of folks, especially people who are not as well networked or connected is like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know 10 high net worths that can just go knock on a door and get hundred K check commitment each. So like, yes and no, right? Like it's all about um, your network and connections. Um, you know, there's this, the concept of family office, right? Like, how do you like, you know, before I became a GP of our fund, I knew zero family office. Like if I were to start a company, I didn't even know who these people are. So I actually think that's also the truth is that it's not necessarily everybody has that level of access. Some people do, 
uh, and they do exist, uh, but I think it's, uh, you know, that's, I think that's probably why I get a lot of these questions, not because people want to take VC money. It's like, that's the only thing they know. And that's the only thing that has some level of transparency, uh, which compared to 15 years ago is becoming a lot more transparent, uh, you know, and, and less yeah. opaque. Yeah, no. And, and I think that's, that's probably a good transition into, you know, the different investment vehicles, because um, I think that something that, uh, Tom, I know you and I have talked about this a number of times, you know, safes, um, that's kind of the, the sexy new way to raise money, right? Uh, the, the Y Combinator and, and safes versus convertible notes. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, kind of confusion around there, uh, around uh, what these exactly are and how they might differ a little bit and when, when it might make sense to consider using one versus the other. Um, so if you don't mind, could you kind of walk us through these a little bit? Yeah, no problem. Um, I guess I could start with preferred stock. Uh, that's kind of the uh, probably the most likely investment vehicle for a VC out of that or a convertible note that converts into preferred stock. It is straight up equity. It's different than common equity because it gets paid first in the event of a waterfall, uh, an event that there's money left to pay the equity. You are pricing your equity, which usually a VC likes to be, and Melody, correct me if I'm wrong here, but usually a VC likes to be the first priced round, although there are a lot of ways to price your round without issuing equity. But preferred stock, because it is equity, is expected to have a lot higher upside, especially if between the time that the VC invests and the time that your company liquidates, there is a large uptick in valuation. Then I think uh, closer to preferred stock is a convertible note. A convertible note is basically debt that has an interest rate and a maturity date, but it can also convert to equity in case the equity piece pays the investor more than the debt piece would. So you get some of the benefits of debt, some of the benefits of equity for the investor. They used to be the standard way to raise capital, especially pre-Series A. And then we've got safes. Safes are obviously what I recommended to you, um, Anthony. Uh, and it's a nice deal if you can get it as an entrepreneur, no interest rate, no maturity date, basically just conversion. It's a promise to give somebody equity upon a future financing or a future um, change of control or event. Uh, it's a lot less hassle. It keeps your cap table slightly cleaner. It has a little bit less lift on the legal side. As you said, the, the docs are out there and they're, they're pretty standard. It's, uh, it's a nice sort of introduction to fundraising, um, although you still do have to grapple with some of the provisions that are common to safes and convertible notes, mainly discounts and valuation caps. Uh, and we can talk about um, discounts and valuation caps if you want. And I th there's a question in the chat actually that, that is kind of relevant here. Do the costs of capital vary for the different instruments? Already mentioned no interest rate for safe. Yeah, I, well, it depends what you define as cost. I always say that equity is more expensive than debt. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always push, if I am representing the investor, I would always want my equity uh, with a little bit of a security. And if I'm pushing for the, um, the company, I'm always saying debt or safe. Uh, the, yeah, it, it, I don't know, the cost of capital can vary in a number of ways, but it kind of depends on how quickly you need capital, how badly uh, you need it, what you're willing to pay for it. There are a lot of lenders out there who will give you, you know, a bridge loan with an astronomical interest rate. Um, but I think that's probably outside of the scope of this discussion. And um, do you want to, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I can answer this very yeah. quickly. Yeah. Most of the time, like I, Tom, remind me, correct me, I'm wrong. Most of the times, the 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 interest in the note is kind of irrelevant. It's like a nominal figure. Um, yeah. So think of a convertible note as a pseudo in between structure. If if a convertible note has a cap, I basically treat it as almost the same as pricing around, except I don't actually have the equity, which is slightly less preferred. And I don't know exactly how much I actually own uh, in the company, nor do you know how much exactly you sold uh, because you can have multiple notes stacked on top of each other without converting because they, they have some kind of trigger conversion event. But 
the real price is the real price difference is going to be about valuation or valuation cap is not like those 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 kind of coupon is very very nominal uh it kind of it doesn't matter yeah really and, and maybe we should say a brief word about equity versus debt so i it, it, in the event that uh it, we don't have uh, some comm school folks here. Uh, the reason that debt versus equity matters is that at some point, uh, hopefully it doesn't happen to you, but if mm -hmm. a company goes under and there is limited money and you can't pay everybody off in mm -hmm. full, then something occurs called a waterfall. Uh, it could be out of court or in bankruptcy court. Basically, they, you have your senior debt holders, you have your junior debt holders, you have your unsecured debt holders, and then you've got your various forms of equity preferred and then all the way at the bottom is common. And so depending on how risky you think your investment is, you would gauge where you want to sit in that payment waterfall. Now, a full discussion of this is obviously outside the, the scope of the panel, but um, just to give you some context as to where you place different investments in the cap structure. The one last thing I'll note, note is that people who invest in early stage are investing for the upside, not the downside. So. Yes, like downside protection matters to some extent, but there, in bear markets where their their investors have a lot more leverage and like shit hit the fan a lot more frequently, and later stage investors where like where you sit on the capital stack because you raise a lot of capital actually matters for very early stage investors at this stage doesn't really matter because you either a hundred x or you're like zero. So so there's 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 very very minor. Uh, relatively less attention paid to those to pr those protected downside because that doesn't really back to the math like that doesn't really help me three x my fund um, if, if that makes sense so that's not where we spend most of our calories uh, but we do we do care more so like you know really understanding the company's cap table and equity uh, who owns what uh, there's clarity and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing for the founders either. Yeah. So, I mean, all that's, that's great. Um, Alex, you've used uh, safe, I think, to, to raise your first round here. Um, and we talked about it in kind of a quasi incubator through, through new labs here in Brooklyn. Um, can you kind of walk us through a little bit of, of how that process went for you and, and how you chose to go uh, with a safe um, as opposed to a convertible note um, mm -hmm. in the process? Yes, sure. So uh, as I was kind of making the leap, you know, still working full time, looking around at ways to raise capital, I went through this process just like um, every founder, I guess, does. But um, in speaking to other founders, I got to know over time, uh, it was clear that safes were great for founders. Um, one, they're not, they're very straightforward. They don't cost a lot of legal fees. Um, they're less confusing, arguably, than a convertible note. Um, and they're very founder friendly, frankly. Um, and the idea was again, in trying to, if you're going to raise you're, you're kind of the safe is implying that you're going to have to have a price round eventually for those safe investors to actually realize, uh, the safe and for it to trigger for them. So they get equity themselves. Um, there was a playbook in my mind, like the bullet point says, raise, uh, about a million or just under on the safe and that'll position us for launch. And then shortly after launch, we could raise a seed round, a price seed round. And that is what a lot of best in class food and beverage companies do. Um, so taking a page out of the, that playbook, again, break some rules, but not all of them. Always think for yourself. So to that end, another thing that's great about the safe is, you know, it doesn't put pressure on you in the same way to raise everything at once and have like these timing deadlines. Um, I was, I've done it kind of my own way, right? Where I raised a chunk just on vision alone, then I raised a chunk when we had the brand and I'm raising another chunk with the brand and uh, some of the original media we're making um, as we continue to do product R&D. Um, and then with New Lab, the tech space run in Brooklyn, they're leading a special purpose vehicle for us that allows investors to get in on the special purpose vehicle. So there's just one line on the cap table I'm sure Melody could speak to this, but generally what I've learned from speaking to folks as a founder is you don't want too many names on your cap or capitalization table because then it, 
it can make it a little confusing for future investors to say, okay, why, why, who are all these 50 people invested in your company? What are their stakes? Why are they even on there? You want sort of impactful investors that are aligned. Um, so we, we have individual angels, but then the, SV, uh, the SPV allows people to get into that SPV so that there's just one line on the cap table that says new lab instead of multiple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, and that brings up a good point. And in, in the interest of time, I think I'll jump to this here. But, you know, investors, um, it's not just about the money, right? Especially in the in the pre-seed and, and seed rounds and, and even later on, you know, but Melody, Tom, Alex, you know, what would you say for approaching investors, um, you know, maybe choose a round uh, that you know, for Alex, uh, maybe to focus on that pre-seed round, or how did you choose investors um, that you wanted to take money from? And what was it that you were kind of looking for from them other than, you know, the check? I mean, the check's great, but, you know, is it, what type of uh, partnership were you looking for with them in that, in that uh, agreement? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to the pre-seed and, and that's the thing, you know, <laughs> this is all very much an art, not a science and things change over time. So maybe I'd have a different response later, but in, at the start, you can't be too picky, right? Um, you take capital where you can, you know, it is hard to raise capital as a first time founder. Um, I think ultimately founders have the, the leverage um, and especially in today's funding environment, it is very beneficial to be on the founder side. Um, but sometimes it's, there's more leverage on the investor side. But um, that being said, um, Friends and family were great at the start. And then I had some former professors invest and, um, you know, those are great in many ways. I want those people involved, but they're not going to be like the well-known people in the startup space. But now we're starting to get some of those checks from people in food and beverage, from people um, in the startup space who, whose names, you know, might intrigue people on the cap table or sort of people say, oh, wow, it's great that you have this person on board. And I think it really is this process of legitimization where um, once you get a couple names, then it's easier to get some of those other names too. Um, it's not a linear process by any means. Sure. And, uh, you know, on that same, that same kind of uh, thing, Tom, what, what um, recommendations would you have for people um, in terms of, you know, legal considerations uh, briefly that, without going into too much detail, right? I know it's a, there's a lot, but that, that people should be considering as they start to approach, you know, these different fundraising rounds. Yeah, in a nutshell, uh, get your shit together. Uh, in a slightly larger nutshell, um, the worst thing that can happen, well, one of the worst things that can happen is, let's say three people found a company uh, one of them leaves, there's a handshake agreement, there's an unsigned stock issuance uh, where the departing founder gets, you know, 25% of the company. Uh, and then you come to me and you say, we're raising a round. And I say, what's your cap table look like? And do you have signed documents for every line on your cap table? And, the, and you say, oh, I think we have it somewhere. And then I go, all right, any equity promised or, you know, not issued? And you say, well, uh, maybe there's this there's this guy who was there at the beginning, but he left because he sucked. Uh, but he, he, you know, he, he, don't worry about him. And I go, oh my god. Uh, so please, 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 if you're going to issue equity, make sure it's signed. Do it right the first time because tracking that person down and convincing them to when there's money on the table, be totally cool with accepting nothing for the equity that they may or may not have and can make a big stink about that's going to cost you. Uh, that's the main thing. Uh, everything else, you know, make sure that you pay for your stock issuances. Make sure that if you have a C corporation, you have your annual meetings and then anything that needs to be approved by the board is improved in writing. Make sure that if you're a founder, you assign your intellectual property while you work for the company on company matters to the company. So that the company actually has something because if you're a SaaS company, what do you have, right? You've got a bunch of code, you got a website, uh, and if you haven't assigned intellectual property to the company, it's not really worth much until you do that. Uh, and then this is just my own pet peeve. Uh, if you have major contracts, don't, don't do them on handshakes, please. Uh, because if I'm trying to value your company and if I'm trying to get you money, 
Uh, a signed contract really helps, not just, oh, these people have been buying from us for a long time. Um, apart from that, yeah, update your cap table, track who you pitch for securities law purposes. Uh, I know we didn't have uh, a ton of time to talk about securities law, but basically, if you do not abide by securities law and you mess up, securities law says you probably have to give a lot of that money back, if not all of it. Uh, so there are different exemptions that you can use for registration uh, with the SEC for your fundraising, but call a lawyer because it's a little bit more complex than you think. Perfect. Well, um, I think with that, why don't we uh, jump into breakout groups uh, for about 20, 25 minutes and then... Uh, yeah, I think that, yeah, I think maybe before that, do we want to just talk as a group for a few minutes? Again, just kind of going back to this, um, this topic of approach, approaching investors, just because I think this is something that, you know, bears a little bit of um, input from everyone. So maybe just for a couple minutes and then we'll move to breakout. Yeah, Melody, do you want to maybe kick us off there? Just a little bit of advice on approaching investors and how you can maybe cultivate that network. Um, Cause I think one of the things we talked about is it might seem like you don't have a network, but maybe you're not thinking about it the right way, you know? Yeah. Um, so I would start with working with what you got. Um, and the being a founder is about parlaying a situation with no resources and no, like no leverage to more resources and leverage. And you, you, you're kind of like, you're not really playing a fair game because otherwise everybody would be a founder. So it is hard by definition. And what I say by me, by parlaying, I mean like, all right, let's think about who you know. If you know all the partners at all the major venture firms, so you got no problem. Most people don't start from that position. So you start off by getting some resources under your belt, you know, start with people who you work for, who, you know, if you say, oh, I don't really know any angel investors. Well, start with people who are further along your career, in their career, who believe in you, who you work for, who you build trust and they have some kind of personal balance sheet that they can, you know, invest in you in 50K or 100K or even 25K. And you just got to collect those checks to get you started. With some resources, then you can show some progress. With some progress shown, you can get more investors who don't have that level of personal trust with you. Like, because then it's gonna, the next tier is gonna be like people who you might think could be directly helpful. Like, you know, Alex is working on a beverage company. So maybe he wants people who gone into retail distribution, who have created an interesting brand, who have manufacturing connections, who, um, I don't know, making stuff up, but like, it, it, then you'd like proactively identify these people and a lot of them could be founders. And I actually think founders is one of those under tapped resource category because they know how hard it is and they've done it before. So they usually have more empathy and they can, they, they, you know, if they've like made it to some, in some capacity, they can also be doing angel investing out of their personal balance sheet. And the other thing I would call out on founders is that they can introduce you to other founders they know and or their investors who invest in their category. So that's like, you know, the keyword here is network because it's about getting to one node that introduces you to other nodes and then gradually upgrading your parlaying to like the higher level and more interesting and more value add, however you think about the hierarchy of investor, larger check size, right? Like you start with a bunch of 25Ks and then you get to the 100K people. And then you get to the smaller fund that can like write 300K checks. And then you get to the lead investor who can write a million dollar check to lead your round. So now then let's say, if you decide that you want to take institutional capital, then there's a systematic way to like do research on these firms. And now I'm entering the world of like, kind of how to like, figure out how to get to these VCs. Um, you know, you can do research by looking at, um, you know, looking firms up on Crunchbase, on PitchBook. Um, the one rule of thumb I would suggest is figuring out whether they're C stage focused firm uh, like NextView or they are 
multi-stage firm. But even multi-stage firms uh, will say we invest at earliest stage. If you go to everybody's website, they'll be like, oh, we want to meet founders at the earliest. So how do you really know is just by looking at their fund size. Um, kind of going back to the return math I mentioned, if you're Andreessen Horowitz and you have a, I don't even know how big their fund is. Let's call it like 5 billion. If that, you have a $5 billion fund and you have 10 partners who needs to dole out $5 billion in, in a three-year time span, why would they want to write a 500K check and spend time with you? Like it mathematically just doesn't make sense. They need to write $15 million checks or $50 million checks because the amount of money they have to deploy as fund managers is fundamentally different than say, you know, we are a four, four person partnership managing a hundred million dollar fund. So of course it makes our, it's worth our while to write a 500K or a million dollar check to invest in two or three companies per year each. So fund size is actually a really, really good way to think about which part of the spectrum in terms of stage people actually specialize. I will cut off anyone that's like over $150 million in their latest fund, not total asset under management. Anyone who has more than a fund size is more than 150, it's very hard for them to focus only at C stage. But some of these larger firms will still do C stage deals because they're buying options. And that's a whole separate topic, which basically means that they're doing that to make sure they have the optionality to not miss out on your next round. So you have to do your calculus in terms of, are they going to really spend time? What if things don't go well? You know, you're going to have signaling risks. Of like, oh, why this firm is not leading your next round? Uh, and then the other thing I would pay attention to is whether these firms actually lead rounds or not. And, you know, kind of in an earlier conversation, we talked about security types, leading rounds, meaning pricing the round most of the time. Um, in the equity race. So if you're raising $3 million, if you talk to some investors, they might be like, oh, we're interested. We might be able to do 200K. Talk to us when you have a lead. You're like, what does that mean? Uh, well, that means that like lead investors usually do more diligence. So a lot of smaller funds and or some angels will want to draft off lead investors' diligence and credibility in the work they do because they don't have the infrastructure and or the experience to do that. And they also set the price meaning the valuation of your company. So it is, I usually advise people to under, at least understand who actually leads and who don't, because it's a lot of times a waste of time. You have a bunch of other soft commitments, but then you don't have a lead. And then all these other people are like, oh yeah, tell me when you have a lead. And that's really annoying. Now, this is potentially one of the benefits of raising on a safe note, because as a founder, you just say, oh, it's on a $5 million cap. Do you want to subscribe or not? Now that becomes less appetizing to institutional investors when you're raising larger amounts of money because they're like, well, I don't think it's $5 million. I think it's something else. And then you could potentially underprice or overprice. Um, yeah, and then like once you figure out who these, who these firms are, it's kind of the, the, the LinkedIn game of figuring out who you know indirectly or directly. Um, the other thing I was mentioned is that it's best to know the partners because they're the decision makers, but don't discount junior people uh, because they don't, they, they, their job is to champion interesting companies uh, inside their firm. So if you, if they actually build conviction on your companies, they can actually be really helpful and be a voice inside the firm. And the other thing is that they are going to be, they could, be more helpful in introducing you to other firms if they can get you through their own internal partnership. So, and the, those junior people are gonna be more available in sharing insights on how to navigate the ecosystem with you. So I would not discount or disrespect um, junior folks. And a lot of partners can, uh, were, were junior folks at one point in their career. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's all, you know, really great. I think, you know, shameless plug here for who's in entrepreneurship, but, uh, you know, this is a, a great way for, for people to, to network as well. And, and there's a lot of really good events out there. Um, you, you know, one of the things that I noticed early on was that there's like, I, I built, I'm building a, a SaaS, a software as a service company. There's countless blogs and founder blogs and and uh, different events that you can join online and, and network, especially right now, you know, in this kind of 
COVID environment where there's all these Zoom events. Um, and it, it gives you the opportunity to, to learn and see things uh, in a different way that maybe wouldn't have been available um, a year and a half ago. Uh, so I, I really recommend that, you know, people join those, you know, try to find those interest groups, if you will, that, that kind of fit what it is that your line of business or your, your founder vision is, um, because there's a lot out there. Um, and sometimes it's just taking the time to kind of weed through it as, as Melody, uh, you know, pointed out. Um, so I think Allison, if you're good with, uh, jumping to our breakout group. So what we're going to do is we have, uh, each of the three panelists, Alex uh, being a founder, Tom, our legal expert, and Melody, kind of our funding side venture capital expert. Um, I think Michael will, will allow for all three uh, to have a breakout room. Please choose which one you want to go into. Um, it's what, seven o'clock now. So I think we'll try to come back together like 7 15, 7 20. Uh, to do our conclusions. And um, with that, I think we are good to All go. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We had our room cut off on a particularly interesting note. So, you know, that's just means that there's just more material for, you know, round two whenever we get there. Um, all right, so before we adjourn, um, just kind of wanted to go through a few quick conclusions. I know that was a lot of information. Um, so I'm going to just share my screen again, and we'll have all of our panelists um, just share their um, kind of main takeaways, um, just as kind of a note to end on. Um, so feel free to chime in. I know these are kind of coming from the three of you. So um, Melody, I think yours was first. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, I think the first two bullet points I wrote. Yeah, first two. Um, so I, I, I think the first thing, you know, kind of to Alex's point, like everybody has a different path. Focus on what makes sense for you and the particular business and the market that you're in. I the, One of the questions that I get asked the most is like, hey, what milestones or tractions do I need to have to raise money from you guys? I was like, that is the wrong question. What is the tractions and milestones you need to see to invest the next five to eight years of your lives in this business? And why would you think that answer is any different than what, how I think about it? I mean, there's going to be a nuanced way of like answering that, but like I, I'm, I urge you people to kind of think more about that because I mean, it, like, I don't know if I mentioned like, I, I was a founder at one point and it didn't go super well. We went through Accelerator. My co-founder broke up with me. We raised a little bit of seat money. I basically eventually did stop working on it after about a year. And my conclusion was like, this stuff takes, regardless whether it's a billion dollar outcome or not, it takes the same amount of bandwidth and mental energy and, and, and mental investment and drain. And, you know, everybody's value system is different. It's just focus on like what makes sense to you. The other thing, and, you know, kind of like I alluded to, it's this raising money is all about network and it's kind of annoying and unfortunate truth. Um, and you know, I, this is not, the session is not about networking, but I would just say that, uh, there are many random and like non-obvious ways to get to people. And there are many random and not obvious connections from years past that I, I still, value and like turn out to be very interestingly helpful. Um, so I, I just urge people to, to kind of think about how to uh, continue to strengthen your network and in a genuine way. Um, so because like introductions, biggest introductions and that's how you get going in terms of fundraising, hiring, uh, sales, everything. Like you're as a founder, you're in a sales job. So um, it's extremely important. Yeah, fantastic point. And I, I think I also love what you wrote here about investing and expanding your network early. This is just fantastic advice for anyone, regardless of whether you're a founder or you're just having trying to have a career at a job or several jobs or you're trying, you have a certain path. I mean, you know, keeping in touch with people, like keeping track of them, like that's just something that is second nature if you are kind of like a freelancer or a founder or something, but most people who are not don't really think about that. And it's so important. Um, so I think that's, that's a really great point. Um, all right. So I think Tom, these next two were yours. <laughs> yeah. And I 
sort of said them before in the course of conversations because they came up and came up in the breakout room. But uh, I, I know that law and is a, a cost center and dealing with lawyers is generally unpleasant. But present company accepted, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah sometimes. Um, but there, there is there's a negative ROI associated with postponing your legal work. It's only going to get more expensive. You do it right the first time and you would be surprised at the benefits of organizing your process, collecting all of your important documents uh, in the same place and getting a handle on uh, how your company runs legally. So do it right the first time. Please, please, please just trust me on that. You do not want to have to. And by the way, if you're small, you go to a lawyer, it's not going to cost as much as if you walk in with a million dollar valuation, right? You go to some startup lawyer, make sure they're a good lawyer, but they're not going to charge you as much because the work's not as complex. You go to a startup lawyer pre-series A and say, I want you to fix me so I can take series A money. It's going to cost a lot. Uh, and then the, the second point, just um, equity is more expensive than debt. I know we talked about this, don't want to belabor it, but I didn't know if we were going to get to it in the, in the uh, presentation. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then Alex, I know this last one is yours, and I think this is a good note to, to end on. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, bullet is pretty straightforward there. Um, I was mentioning the breakout room, abundance mentality. Um, there's a lot of capital out there. You know, it's almost like dating where you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And if you come on too strong with someone, they might get a little spooked, right? So remain confident, talk to a lot of people, keep your options open. Um, you, that almost in your subconscious affects how you interact with people consciously. Um, and you can fake it till you make it, but you can also actually make it. And like Melody was saying, um, just talk to a lot of people, like introductions. You got to dime with both feet. Um, it's a lot of the job is selling yourself, selling a vision. That is what fundraising is. And you need a certain energy and will there. And that can be fake, but it can also be made. Um, and it's best made in my mind by just going in confidently and believing in yourself. Um, networks are huge too. Um, the UVA network is an amazing one. And I've been really grateful. Um, I've had multiple UVA alums invest, former professors. So uh, I guess I'll end on that note as we're all very lucky to have each other. Um, the UVA network in particular, wahoo wada that. You know, I think it's great because UVA people, we're like a great school, but we're not like, assholes like harvard and stuff who just like maybe don't look at each, at each other the same way or think they're too good or who knows what but i think UV has a great history of entrepreneurship where folks are small smart book smart but also very street smart and you need that street smart when you're fundraising too so um anyway you can always start with the uva network it's a great one and i've i've had a lot of value from it Awesome. Thank you so much. I love that to end on. Um, so thanks everyone so much for attending. Uh, thank you, Melody, Tom, and Alex so much for sharing your advice. This is really good and valuable. Really appreciate it. Um, look out. I will send around this presentation to everyone who um, RSVP'd as well as later the recording when we have that um, and also information about our next event. Still um, nailing down the date, but it should be a good one. Um, it's going to be something kind of around sort of mental health and creating a, a winning mindset as an entrepreneur or sole entrepreneur. It'll be in probably late May. So look out for that. Um, and thank you all again so much for attending tonight. Um, and we look forward to more soon.